we've actually been encouraging non-Christians to get married because marriage is good for them as well. Uh, marriage is good for non-Christian children to be raised by married mothers and fathers because it's something about human nature that's fulfilling and not just about supernatural realities. So let me pivot to that and say, well, why does marriage matter, especially as a political institution? Um, I think you could all give answers as to why it matters to the church, uh, why marriage matters uh, as an institution that um, can be sanctifying, why marriage matters as a covenantal or sacramental union. Why does marriage also matter as a natural institution for public policy that the state of Wyoming is interested in? <laughs> the state of Wyoming is not in the baptism business. The state of Wyoming is not in the marriage business. Why is the state of Wyoming in the marriage business? And, you know, I think that's a question that deserves an answer. So let me um, approach that now in this second subheading of why does marriage matter? From a policy perspective, marriage exists to unite a man and a woman as husband and wife, so they will then be mother and father to any children that their union creates. Marriage is based on three secular truths. It's based on anthropological truth that men and women are distinct and complementary. It's based on the biological fact that reproduction requires both a man and a woman. And it's based on a social reality that children deserve both a mother and a father. When you put those three things together, that anthropological truth, that biological fact, that social reality, it's easier to see why government has always taken an interest in the marital relationship. Whenever a child is born, a mother's always close by. She'll normally be in the same room. <laughs> That's a simple fact of biology. The question for culture, the question for a wall, is will a father be close by? And if so, for how long? And marriage is an institution that diverse communities all across the globe and all throughout human history utilize to maximize the likelihood that that man commits to that woman and the two of them committed to each other will commit to that child. Because when this doesn't happen, social costs run high. That's what Moynihan was talking about 50 years ago in his report. That's what now people on the right like Charles Murray and people on the left like Robert Putnam are talking about when they talk about the statistic of 40% of all Americans, 50% of Hispanics, 70% of African Americans being born to single mothers. That when marriages fail to form in the first part, or when they fall apart prematurely, the social costs, the political costs, to those children, to those women, to those communities, are astronomical. Partly this is because there's no such thing as parenting. There's no such thing as parenting in the abstract. There's mothering and there's fathering. Men and women bring different gifts to the parenting enterprise, and children do best when they have both a mother and a father. Don't just take my word for this. Let me read you a quote from a Professor David Popino. He's a professor of social science at Rutgers University in New Jersey. And he did a literature review of all of the social science on parenting. And this is what he concluded. The burden of social science evidence supports the idea that gender differentiated <coughs> parenting is important for human development and that the contribution of fathers to child rearing is unique and irreplaceable. He then went on, quote, we should disavow the notion that mommies can make good daddies, just as we should disavow the popular notion that daddies can make good mommies. The two sexes are different to the core and each is necessary culturally and biologically for the optimal development of a human being. Now, what's Professor Popino getting at? And anyway, when he writes this, he's responding to the statistics of 40% of all kids being born to single mothers. So when he says, you know, the contribution of fathers are irreplaceable, that's simply to acknowledge the reality that 40, 50, 70% of these kids are growing up without their fathers. When we talk about single parenting, it's almost always single mothers. They're the ones that actually take responsibility for their kids when the father is being an absentee dad. And he's saying that those absentee dads, they actually matter. They make a difference in the lives of their children. That's what the social science shows. Let me try to illustrate it with a couple um, examples. If I tell you it's Saturday morning and a five-year-old boy is in the living room and he's wrestling with one of his parents, and the parent is 
teaching the five-year-old that it's okay to put people in headlocks, but it's not okay to pull hair or to bite or to gouge eyes. Which parent is most likely in the living room? <laughs> and the laughter gives it away. Um, it's all written on the heart. It's the self-evident truth that all of our grandmothers uh, would have known. Is that it's most likely the father. And that's not because we've engaged in some global conspiracy of gender conformity and stereotypes <laughs> which only fathers are allowed to wrestle with their five-year-old sons. This is what comes naturally to guys. Mm -hmm. Guys enjoy roughhousing with each other, and they enjoy roughhousing with their children. And that, that matters. I mean, this is the same way that you think about it. Uh, fathers are more likely to throw newborn babies up in the air. Yeah. But mothers are more likely to say, I'm not so hot. <laughs> and that matters. I mean, think about it. It's not, again, because of some global gender norm stereotype. If, if you've carried a child in your womb for nine months, that might make you simply by nature more nurturing, more caring, more, more comforting, supportive. Uh, women in general are, are all of those things, and mothers in particular tend to be all of those things. There's something about carrying your own child in your womb that simply inclines you to be a little more sensitive about safety, security, uh, nurturing, those sorts of things. This matters um, because what we do when we uh, take a step back from the anecdote, the anecdote's meant to get you to laugh. The, the laughter actually reveals that we know things that popular culture and the media and the politically correct police tell us we're not allowed to say we know. Um, you know, the laughter actually shows that you do know it. Um, why does this matter? Look at the statistics. Boys who grow up without their fathers are more likely to commit crime, less likely to graduate from school, more likely to end up in jail, less likely to be employed. Because the father is doing something for his son. He's helping his son develop into a law-abiding, productive member of society that we call a man. And so, you know, the, the, the five-year-old boy wrestling with his father, the father's setting limits, okay for headlocks, not okay to pull hair or to gouge out eyes or to bite. Maybe it's with a 10-year-old son in the backyard tossing around a football, maybe it's with a 15-year-old son helping him to tie a necktie, getting ready for his first high school dance. The father is helping his son channel distinctively masculine tendencies in a constructive rather than a destructive manner. And the father has a unique advantage in doing that uh, precisely because he's a man, and he can help his son, his boy, develop into a man. Fathers do something complementary for their daughters. Fathers, on average and for the most part, tend to be larger than mothers. Uh, fathers, on average and for the most part, tend to have deeper voices than mothers. Fathers, on average and for the most part, tend to have once been young men themselves. <laughs> and so they know what the wrong sort of young man might be looking for in their daughter. So fathers tend to be the ones that scare away bad boyfriends. <laughs> fathers tend to be the ones who police who it is that's pursuing their daughters. Amen. A father who is married to his daughter's mother also models what a good male-female relationship looks like. The father who's married to his daughter's mother and treats the mother correctly is showing his daughter, even without ever saying a thing, simply by his life, how a man ought to treat a woman and what she might therefore look for in a boyfriend, a potential fiancé, and husband. Don't just take my word for this. Step back with the social science. Girls who grow up without their fathers, they start sexual activity earlier in life. They're more likely to be pregnant outside of marriage they're more likely to have an abortion. Because one of the things that the father does for his daughter is he helps protect a sphere of innocence. He helps protect her innocence so that she can develop at an age-appropriate time. But she doesn't start uh, these adult activities, these sexual activities, too soon in life. He can shield her from some of those realities in the post-sexual revolution world. Let me give you some hard statistics. I'm going to read you a quote, and I'm going to ask you uh, which right-wing nut job <laughs> said this. Uh, so you can put on your thinking hat. We know the statistics. Children who grow up without a father are five times more likely to live in poverty and commit crime, nine times more likely to drop out of school, and 20 times more likely to end up in prison. They are more likely to have behavioral problems or run away from home or become teenage parents themselves. And the foundations of our community are weaker because of it. 
Who's the right wing nut job that said that? Is that Billy Graham? Is that Dr. James Dobson? Is that John Paul II? Hillary? <laughs> Barack Obama. It's President Obama before he evolved. <laughs> now, why is that? He actually gives us an answer as to why that is. Um, he, gave, he gave the commencement address at the all male historically black college, Morehouse College. And so he had a captive audience, um, a bunch of men, young men graduating, uh, many of whom didn't have fathers themselves, and he encourages them to be good fathers. And then he explains why. He says, quote, I have tried to be for Michelle and my girls what my father was not for my mother and me. I want to break that cycle. And so there are two things, three things to say about this. First, that President Obama up until his evolution has actually been really heroic in talking about the importance of fathers. He's been more muted since coming out in favor of gay marriage because it looks like it's a criticism of lesbian mothers if you're talking about the importance of fathers. So it's hard to square that circle. Um, the second thing to say is that regardless of your politics, you know whether you are a Republican or a Democrat, whether you're in favor of the Obama presidency, um, you can't deny that he himself has lived a successful life. You know, he's lived a flourishing life. So he is the exception to all those statistics. Um, I don't want to suggest that if you grow up without a married mother and father, you're somehow destined to go to jail or to be unemployed or to not graduate from school. Um, that's not the case. Social science is always on average and for the most part. You know, he gives the statistics of five times more likely to be in poverty, nine times more likely to drop to school, 20 times more likely to end up in prison. But that doesn't mean everyone is doomed to suffer and be a failure. He's clearly, regardless of your politics, uh, uh, an example of that. But then the third thing is that he's the exception that proves the rule. You know, that's precisely why he was speaking about this. The priest, you know, what he says is that he wants to break that cycle. He wants to be the husband and the father to Michelle and his daughters that his father wasn't for his mother and for him because it matters. Because he knows that he beat the odds, but that many children aren't so lucky to beat the odds. And that they have a tougher road in life, not because of anything they've done wrong, Right? This is not no fault of their own. They're going to have a more challenging road ahead of them because of family structure into which they were born. And the law and our culture is to blame for those family structures. Right? It's the law and the culture that shapes the sorts of family structures that we end up with in the United States. It's Hollywood and the government that has a large uh, force in this. And it's the church. I mean, so the other thing here is that, you know, what's actually taking place in your congregation. So, we're going to talk more about that in the third uh, section. The day's more focused on uh, this morning. More focused on the politics. But I mean, we want to say that you know the three largest culture-shaping institutions are going to be Hollywood and popular culture. It's going to be the government and the public school system and the laws. But it's also going to be the church. And every Sunday morning, you all have a captive audience. And what are you doing to shape that? Before getting ahead to that, though, let me just finish up this second. You know, why does marriage matter for policy? Obama's quotations kind of help explain what it's the state in the marriage business. It's not because it's a sucker for romance. You know, the government doesn't care about the butterflies that you know form in your stomach when you fall in love. That's not what gets the government in the marriage business. What gets the government in the marriage business is that the sexual union of a man and a woman can produce a child, and that child deserves a mother and a father. And the state's not going to coercively force men and women to raise their kids. The state can only encourage them to do so. And the way that the state non-coercively encourages this is by upholding an ideal, upholding an institution known as marriage, and encouraging men and women to become husbands and wives, to then be mothers and fathers. When this fails to happen, or when it falls apart, that's where you see the rise of child poverty that's where you see the decrease in social mobility. That's where you see the increase in welfare spending. That's where you see the increase in police activity and the prison populations. So again, regardless of whether you're a liberal or a conservative, a Democrat or a Republican, everything you could care about, if you care about poverty and liberty, if you care about freedom and the poor, if you care about social justice and limited government, 
Everything you could care about, whether on the left or the right, is served by strong marriages. And that explains why the state takes an interest in the marital relationship. So let me um, pivot now to the last section for this morning, and then hopefully we'll have some time for your questions. Let me just go through four consequences of redefining marriage. Um, because you could say that you've agreed with me up until now. You've followed every step along the way. Um, there's a bad vision of human sexuality and of marriage that comes out of the 1960s. It comes out of the sexual revolution. It says consenting adults should do whatever consenting adults want to do. That's what gave us the hookup culture and cohabitation, <coughs> non-marital childbearing, and the high rates of divorce. And you know this understanding of marriage simply as intense emotional union can't explain anything distinctive of marriage. So that's a bad philosophy of marriage. There's this alternative, good philosophy of marriage, a comprehensive union of sexually complementary spouses, so it unites a man and a woman in a permanent and exclusive bond as husband and wife, so that children will have both a mother and a father because that matters. It provides the best outcomes for children and for society as a whole. You can say, I agree with all of that, but what's the big deal if the government allows Adam and Steve to get married? How does Adam and Steve getting married hurt you, or your marriage, or children, or society, or impact anyone at all? Now, that's the question that I think was frequently put uh, to people who were defending uh, the truth about marriage over the past decade or so. And we were given 15 seconds to answer it. I mean, that's the problem, that you know, you're given a sound bite on the Piers Morgan show to explain 50 years worth of bad marital practice in the United States. They want to know, well, how is this going to impact it? Well, it's taken me, I don't know, 40 minutes to get to this part of this morning's presentation, because it's only if you have this background understanding can you then understand how redefining marriage is going to have negative consequences. Uh, because to a certain extent, what Anthony Kennedy did was he took the logic of the sexual revolution to its logical conclusion. But it's a bad train of logic. It's a bad train of logic. It starts on bad premises about human nature, about the human person. And then all of the pit stops along the way have been bad consequences themselves. Whether it's the hookup culture, non-marital childbearing, cohabitation, no-fault divorce, and now same-sex marriage. And so our culture shaped our law. But what I'm going to suggest in these four consequences is that our law will now further shape our culture. That the legal redefinition of marriage will now further deteriorate our marriage culture. And the best way of thinking about this is simply to say that ideas have consequences. And bad ideas have bad consequences. That's what's going to be taking place in the years and decades to come now that the court has redefined marriage, is that whereas the law had been teaching the truth about marriage, a permanent, exclusive, monogamous union of husband and wife because kids deserve moms and dads, instead the law will be teaching marriage is about consenting adult romance of whatever size or shape the consenting adults most desire, and the kids will be all right no matter what. The law can't teach both of these things, and it's going to be shifting from what the government does, to what public schools do, to what the non-discrimination ordinances do, is going to be shifting from this understanding of human sexuality and marriage to this understanding. And over time, the law shapes our culture, our culture shapes our beliefs, and then our beliefs shape our actions. And so over time, your children, your grandchildren, your great-grandchildren, uh, despite the countervailing influence of the church, the popular culture and the law and the government will, will be teaching something else. And that's going to shape their worldview. So let me go through this um, in four steps. First, first consequence of the legal redefinition of marriage. In the United States today, there is no public institution that upholds even the ideal that every child deserves both a mother and a father. To even suggest that a child has a right to both a mom and a dad, will quickly be viewed as a form of hate speech, as it already is in parts of Canada and Europe. Um, a year ago, um, about a year, a, a week from now, a year ago, so it was the week before Thanksgiving a year ago, I was at the Vatican for this international interfaith colloquium that Pope Francis had organized. Uh, and they had leaders from all the world's religious traditions, um, Catholic, Protestant, 
Jewish, uh, Muslim, uh, Buddhist, Hindu, Jain, Zoroastrian. Um, they disagree about all sorts of things when it comes to the nature of God, the nature of reality, and yet they could all agree on one thing, the importance of sexual complementarity. And the conference was called Humanum, about humanity, uh, and it was talking about how we're created male and female and why that matters. And all of these various religious traditions, while they disagreed about so much else, could agree about the importance of male-female sexual complementarity. And in the address that Pope Francis gave, he said that a child has a right to a mother and a father. The media didn't report on that, because the media doesn't like that aspect of Pope Francis. They, they like the global warming, environmentalist, anti-capitalism Pope Francis. But that sort of a statement is increasingly in our culture going to be viewed with suspicion. If not, it's going to be viewed even worse as a form of hate. Because right now, what we've done is that we have uh, marriage redefined to be primarily about the desires of the adults involved in the relationship, rather than the needs or the rights of the children. Historically, marriage was about both. So historically, marriage had a horizontal component, uh, the spousal unity, the union of husband and wife. It also had a vertical component, uh, the next generation, creating new life and then uniting new life with mom and dad. You know, there was a generative aspect of marriage. It was called the generative act. It was about creating the next generation. Uh, that's built into the sound understanding of marriage. It's both about spousal unity and about uh, generativity. What the redefinition of marriage does is simply cut out that vertical aspect. It makes it only about the horizontal. Marriage is simply about consenting adult romance and caregiving. And now if you think about the statistics that I opened with, 40% of all children, 50% of Hispanics, 70% of African Americans born to single mothers. How do we insist with the pre-evolution Obama that those fathers are essential when Anthony Kennedy has redefined marriage to make fathers optional? You know, when I said, that's the challenge for Obama, how does he square that circle? And that's the first consequence of redefining marriage, the pedagogical consequence. Pedagogical meaning teaching function. The law has a teaching function, and what it will be teaching is that men and women are interchangeable, mothers and fathers are replaceable. Two moms, two dads, the same thing as a mom and a dad. Second consequence is that there's no logical reason for the redefinition of marriage to stop here. Um, and the best way of illustrating this is simply to quote uh, gay activists on the left who have devised, have come up with new words to describe where they would like to see future redefinition. Uh, the first is the term thruple. A thruple is a three-person couple. Take the word couple, chop off the C, and then add a THR. Thruple. And uh, this was in New York Magazine. New York Magazine is not a fringe you know, blog with someone in the basement of his mother's house wearing pajamas. Well, I mean, this is a prominent publication in New York City. And what happens in New York today will happen in Wyoming in a decade. Um, and that's tends to be how these social changes work. And what they were doing, they were profiling a gay throuple in New York City. It was three men who live with each other and love each other and they sleep with each other. They cook meals for each other. And they want to have a joint checking account. And they want to file a joint tax return. Um, they want to have all three names of the mortgage and the deed of the house. If one of them passes away, the other two want to be co-heirs, et cetera, et cetera. If marriage is simply about consenting adult romance and caregiving, they have a marriage. If you go before the Supreme Court and you demand marriage equality for the same-sex couple, on what basis do you deny marriage equality to the same-sex throuple? Or to the opposite sex quartet. Uh, again, homosexuality, heterosexuality makes no difference here. So it could be two guys and two girls, a foursome, quartet, who want to have a marriage. What would be your limiting principle? The way that we arrived at monogamy in Western law and culture is that it's one man and one woman who can unite as one flesh in the act that can create new life and every new life has one mother and one father. Marriage was about uniting those people in a stable, permanent, exclusive relationship. 
But once you say the male-female part of marriage is irrational and arbitrary and bigoted, once you say the procreative nature of marriage um, is an outdated holdover of Judaism and Christianity, once you say the mothering-fathering part of marriage is simply based on bigoted gender stereotypes, what's your principal basis for monogamy? What's magical about the number two once you say the male-female part of marriage is irrational? The next term is the word monogamish. Uh, this was in the New York Times Sunday Magazine. So probably the most prominent publication in American life. And it was a profile of the gay rights activist Dan Savage. And they asked Dan Savage, what will straight couples learn from gay couples once marriage is redefined? And he said they will learn the virtue of the open relationship, the monogamish relationship. The title of this article, if you want to look it up, was Married, comma, with Infidelities. And Savage was redefining infidelity, um, not as a vice any longer, but as a virtue of the monogamous relationship, the virtue of the open relationship. His argument was that, look, um, you straight people have this uptight, outdated notion of sexual fidelity, but one person can't fulfill all of your sexual needs till the day you die. And that's why people cheat on one another. That's why they then, when they find out about the cheating, because they had an unrealistic expectation in the first place, when someone fails to live up to it, they get upset and their heart's broken. Why not just have realistic expectations to begin with? And he said, provided there's no coercion, there's no deceit, you're open and honest about it, there's no reason why spouses shouldn't be able to have open marriages. That their marital union, the romantic caregiving union, could actually be enhanced by non-marital sexual fulfillment. And with this understanding of marriage, there doesn't seem to be any reason why not. The last term is the term wed lease. And this was about two years ago in the Washington Post. Um, wed lease is a play on the word wedlock. If wedlock is meant to denote something that's strong and sturdy and permanent, wed lease is meant to denote the exact opposite. Uh, just like you can lease a car or you can lease a house. You should be able to lease a spouse. Um, this was the idea of having temporary marriage licenses. The problem with marriage in the United States is that we have this holdover from Judaism and Christianity that marriage is a permanent union. But that's unrealistic, that's inhumane. Nothing in life is permanent. Everything is transient, transitory. And so you can't make a 60, 70, 80 year commitment to another person. You can't pledge till death do you part. And that's why 40 to 50% of marriages end in divorce. Because you made an unrealistic commitment in the first place, you couldn't live up to it, it breaks people's hearts. A better idea, he argued, would be have a wedding lease. Have a five year marriage license, which could be renewed on good behavior, but which otherwise would simply dissolve. In the same way that when you um, are renting an apartment when you're leasing a car, you know, you upgrade to a better model after a couple of years. <laughs> Why not do the same thing? And of course it was a male lawyer who wrote this. <laughs> you can see the attractiveness of this to the men involved. Now I said at the beginning, I'm not a theologian, so I'm not going to talk about the morality or the theology of throuples and wed leases and monogamous relationships. I'm going to leave that to you guys. I just want to think about the public consequence, the political costs involved. I said that the reason the states in the marriage business is to get one man and one woman to commit to each other permanently and exclusively so that any children that they create will have both a mother and a father committed to them. The Wedleys, the thruple, the monogamous relationship directly undercut the public purpose of marriage. Because they increase the number of sexual partners that men and women have and they decrease the amount of commitment that sexual partners make to one another. They increase the odds of fragmented families and fatherless kids. And yet all three of these further redefinitions follow as a logical matter, just like night follows one day, once you get rid of male-female complementarity. So if you're a visual learner, a way to think about this is that male-female sexual complementarity is the foundation upon which the building blocks of monogamy exclusivity and permanency are built. And so if you wipe out that foundation, 
it's only a matter of time before those blocks come, come crumbling down. And already there's a lawsuit in the Ninth Circuit arguing for a constitutional right to polygamy. It's not surprising the timing of these things. Marriage is just about consenting about love. If love equals love, why can't you add one more equal sign? And love equals love equals love. Big love gets its marriage equality as well. Very hard to see once you get rid of these foundational uh, uh, principles what would be the end point of the unraveling. Uh, the third consequence uh, deals with unborn human life. Um, so if you're a pro-lifer, you need to be concerned about the definition of marriage. Because ultimately, at the end of the day, the best protector of unborn children is marriage. Marriage and the virtue of chastity are the best uh, institutional defense uh, against abortion. Uh, let me explain this in two steps, how redefining marriage implicates unborn children. Because it's a little counterintuitive at first, but I think uh, once you see it, you can't not see it. It's one of those things that once it clicks, it's like, how did I not see this from the beginning? It seems so evident. Uh, the first is that, at a worldview level, the worldview of same-sex marriage is the worldview of consenting adults should do whatever consenting adults want to do. Increasingly, it's the worldview of consenting teenagers should do whatever consenting teenagers want to do. That is what drives the demand side of abortion. If you think of Planned Parenthood as being the supply side of abortion, they're the suppliers of it. Well, what is it that creates the crisis pregnancies that end up at Planned Parenthood in the first place? And it's frequently non-marital sexual relations. And so a worldview that further normalizes the hookup culture, that further normalizes the idea that consenting high schoolers and consenting college students and consenting adults should do whatever consenting people want to do, will further entrench that habit and that moral imagination, that worldview in your parishioners, in your children, and in your grandchildren. Um, another way of thinking about that is to simply to say, in all the years that I've been engaging on this issue, I've never heard someone say, I'm in favor of gay marriage and I'm in favor of chastity. Mm. It's not that it's impossible to be in favor of both of those things. It's just that as a, at a conceptual level, at the worldview level, they typically don't hang together. Right? Typical, uh, certain beliefs cluster together. Those beliefs tend not to cluster together. So you can only imagine what will now be further promoted in TV, in movie, in public school systems as a result of the changing understanding of what marriage is. So that's the conceptual uh, level. There's also a very particular, so the second way in which redefining marriage impacts this, is that redefining marriage redefines parenting, redefines parenthood, which means it will also redefine childhood and the creation of children. Uh, and again, it's not that gays and lesbians are somehow uniquely to blame for this. Straight people do. The problem here is that we have an unregulated industry of assisted reproductive technologies. Uh, ever since the first IVF baby 40 years ago, Louise Brown, we have a totally unregulated uh, infertility industry.